Dr. Scammer, do you have everybody here? I believe we do. Cool. I would like to call, good evening. I would like to call the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Fullerton Joint Union High School to order. Pursuant to the Governor's Code Executive Order N2920, the Board is authorized to hold this meeting via teleconferencing and to make this meeting accessible electronically to all members of the public seeking to observe and address the Board. At this time, uh, will you please rise and say the flag salute with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic, the Republic which stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I would like to ask that each board member answer that you are present and can hear me when I call your name. Ms. Bushing? Here. Ms. Foley? Here. Ms. Katzker? Ms. Katzker? She's uh, muted. Oh my gosh, I need new technology. <laughs> we got you. I hear you. Dr. Zhang? Here. Very good. Um, I would like to remind the board that all votes taken during this meeting will be taken via roll call votes with Ms. Harder. Approval of the agenda. I would like to call for a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Move approval. Second, Marilyn. Okay. Is there any discussion of the agenda? Hearing and seeing none, I would like to call Ms. Harder for a roll call vote. Mr. Montoya? Aye. Ms. Bushy? Ms. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Ms. Pasker? Aye. Dr. Jane? Aye. Thank you. At this point, we're going to go on to 1.4 public comments regarding items that are on the agenda. And we have received three comments to read. The first comment was written in Spanish, but we translated it. And um, with the help of Dr. Kaufman and Ms. Harder, we um, were able to get the translation. And through Dr. Kaufman and our community liaison, they've already reached out to this, to this uh, parent because there were a couple questions about what she had written in, in regards to um, a couple other words. So this is what she wrote. Good afternoons and good afternoon and greetings to you. My question is, I understand that you will approve distance learning, but how will you do this? Asynchronous or synchronous? And if we parents are going to have support, not all of us understand the complexity of technology and my son is entering ninth grade and he is going to, and is he going to pass with those who are beginning an IEP evaluation within this new form of education? Thanks. That was the first public comment. The second one is written by Susanna Fan, and she writes, as a parent of a junior at Fullerton Union High School, I fully support Governor Newsom's mandate to start the school year 100% distance learning. We need to keep not only our students and families safe, but also our teachers, staff, and their families. Safety and health should be the priority. When is it, when it is safe to do so, FJUHSD should transition to a safer hybrid model, like one week on and two weeks off for each cohort, three cohorts. This would be the safest for students, teachers, and staff and families. We abhor OC Board of Education recommendations and are grateful for the leadership of Governor Newsom and the FJUHSD to open school based on science and health, not politics. Lastly, when school does resume, mask and social distance should be mandatory for all plus better for all, plus better ventilation, open doors and windows, not just filters. Thank you, FJUHSD. Latest research is children ages 12 and older transmit COVID-19 as much as adults. And this is cited from CNN and um, the link is below cnn.com. Public comment number three. Good afternoon, President Montoya, trustees and Superintendent Scambray. 
Our negotiating team has been hard at work this summer in striving to support the reopening of our campuses in the safest manner possible. It is our hope that you will follow the governor's executive order and begin the 2020-2021 school year in 100% distance learning model being proposed tonight. Our team is happy to negotiate any and all changes to our working conditions this pandemic brings. Our position remains to ensure safe, safe working conditions for our members. Thank you for all the work you are doing on behalf on our behalf, and we look forward to continued communication with our members. <clears throat> and that was the, um, the public comments that were written before this meeting. Toya? Yes. Okay. I don't believe you said who the last public comment was. I apologize. That was written by FSTO President Angie Senkak. Thank you, Ms. Harder. Okay. We are on to number two reports. General 2.1.1, approval of 100% distance learning schedule for the 2020-2021 opening of school. I will be presenting the statements. It's a, it's a background and timeline. On July, excuse me, on June 29th, 2020, the Board of Trustees granted tentative approval of a hybrid schedule for the 2021 opening of schools. Pending verification from the safety, district safety subcommittee that schedule, that the schedule meets all of the requirements for in-person instruction. The safety subcommittee is continuing to meet to finalize their recommendations for the safe opening of the 2021 school year to present to the Board of Trustees. After seeing the number of COVID-19 cases rise, board members became concerned with the opening of schools, even using the hybrid model schedule mentioned above. On July 9th, 2020, the superintendent notified FJUHSD community that due to the recent resurgence of COVID-19 cases in California, it has been, excuse me, it has made the opening of schools more complicated than previously anticipated. And that if a different plan of action is necessitated, the district would comply with state and local health and education officials recommendations. In addition, even prior to the governor's action, distance learning was already under consideration as the likely way that we would, that school would begin. On July 17, 2020, Gavin, excuse me, California Governor Gavin Newsom, in per partnership with the California Department of Public Health, announced strict guidance relative to opening of schools for the fall, for fall 2020. The governor stated that in order to open schools for in-person instruction, counties must have 14 consecutive days off of the California Department of Public Health's COVID-19 monitoring list. Orange County has been identified as one of the counties that does not meet the criteria to open schools with an in-person format. With this being said, I would like to ask for a motion to approve 100% distance learning schedule for the 2021 opening of school. I'll make that motion, Mr. Montoya. President Montoya. I'll second. Second, uh, motion by Ms. Folly and seconded by Ms. Klatsker. Um, any discussion? Um, Ms. Folly, is that your hand? I'm sorry, I think Marilyn was making a comment, but she's muted. I'm okay now. Okay, um, Marilyn? Are we going to have any staff report relative to the opening in terms of any details at this time? Dr. Stanbury? Uh, yes, we'll, we will uh, most likely open our offices back. I believe August 3rd is a Monday. Um, teachers, uh, the classrooms will be open for the teachers also. You know, I'm sorry that we're not getting the safety committee report tonight because I think that has some relationship to the opening of the classrooms for the teachers going back to work. Um, is, what question do you have regarding that? 
I just think there... people are interested in exactly, I, I've heard a lot of the things that we're doing and I think they're very good, but I think that the public uh, and our teachers also need to know this. Is there another way to make this information available other than this board meeting? Yeah, we're going to present at the August board meeting, which is a week before school starts. It looks like we have almost 200 people listening tonight that might be interested in something like that too. Right, we're going, the safety committee is still working and organizing the information. Um, we will be presenting at the, the August board meeting, I believe it's is it the fourth, Linda? Yeah. So tonight we're, we are um, looking at going the 100% the distance learning but we will have, we're looking at presenting on the 4th of August, the, the safety concerns and the questions that the board members had in the community had. I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, uh, I would hope that we can move from the distance learning to something that in some format that lets the students go back to the campuses and the teachers. Um, Will there be something in a future report that gives us information in how agile the organization will be in moving from one format to another format? Yes, that will be presented with the safety committee uh, recommendations. Uh, currently, as Andy mentioned, we're, Orange County is still on the watch list. And I believe that uh, once we are off the watch list and then following the two weeks after that, uh, I'm thinking it would take us uh, about a week because our schedule is set up to move right from distance learning into some type of a hybrid model. But I would, I would think it would take us a, about a week to do that, to transition over. So we would not have the situation where we'd say, okay, we've got to do this quarter in this format if that did not no. prove to be necessary. No. Okay. Uh, Dr. Scanberry or President Montoya, is part of that going to be covered in the presentation for from the instructional committee tonight? The transition to a uh, the hybrid model, right? And maybe it's not. I was just wondering. No, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. I don't believe it is. No. Yeah, we had. I had a conversation of uh, thinking or was thinking. You know, if we're at day eleven of being okay on this uh, or off the watch list or what have you, start thinking about it. And, and that was just one of my concerns as well, is, is when do we go back as well? So. We will be ready. Okay. Ms. Patsker, are you good? Um, yeah, I just had one quick follow-up question. So campuses will be reopened on the third, is that correct, Dr. Scamray? Correct. Okay, so teachers would be able to go retrieve materials from their classrooms at that point or to work with their site admin to set up a schedule for retrieving their things from their classrooms? Correct. Okay. Okay, Dr. Zhang, do you have any? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm going to ask Ms. Harder for the roll call vote. Mr. Montoya? Aye. Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jang? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to 2.2, Education and Assessment Services. Uh, presentation for district, uh, the District Instructional Committee. Um, I'd like to call on Troy High School Principal and Chair of the District Instructional Committee, uh, Mr. Will Minster. Dr. Minster will give the presentation. Uh, President Montoya, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, uh, superintendent and members of the board. I would like to uh, defer uh, to Dr. Bailey of Sonora High School. He is the true chair of this committee. I am his assistant, and he is going to lead this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Minster, um, and uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, President Montoya, Superintendent Scambray, board members, cabinets, and guests. Um, I believe we have some slides to share, and I'm not sure if those are coming up or not, or if the board has those, um, but we have our team here. We had an amazing group uh, of 
uh, staff members from teachers from across the district, uh, parents uh, on our committee, and uh, Stu Damaris from uh, La Habra High School. She was wonderful. And so we developed a slideshow to share with you. And I'm not sure where that is, but. I believe Ms. Harder, can you make um, or have Weston um, make Ms. Dr. Bailey a host? Um, I, I believe Dr. Bailey, you're going, you can share your um, presentation now. Weston has uh, allowed you to share the screen. I apologize, Weston. I see your, uh, your name is FJUHSD conferencing. So that's why I forget that you're on here. So thank you. Go, go ahead and share Dr. Bailey. You're all set. I'm used to the hosting. There we go. Can share my screen. Just pop up here. Okay, hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, thank you very much to uh, President Montoya, Superintendent Scambray, and the board members, cabinets, and guests. Um, our overview, we had a uh, fantastic committee uh, put together uh, on the early part of July. Um, we had seven fantastic meetings that all lasted at least 90 minutes. Um, we had to separate into small groups for more efficient and focused discussions, which were really powerful, and the teams got a lot done. Uh, and we developed the final document of recommendations for administrative council. And we took a vote on that yesterday and it was approved 26 to zero. Uh, goals of the instruction and student progress committee. There was two big goals that we really had, uh, making sure that we had transparent and inclusive discussions that valued all of our stakeholders. Uh, we modeled the, uh, the new virtual classroom video camera for a couple of our meetings for our teachers. We felt that was very important and uh, uh, Weston, uh, Mr. Baugh was very uh, instrumental in helping us with that. Uh, average attendance, we had 30 staff members, uh, parents and student uh, average attendance in the summer meeting, which was just fantastic. Um, and we focused on making relevant and appropriate recommendations for teachers to administrative council, um, in which we have an 11 page document that we're ready to share uh, with AC. Uh, members of our committee speaking this evening. So Damaris Oaks from La Habra High School, our student, she's been really important. She's made every meeting. In fact, even when she was on the way to vacation, she joined us, which was great. Uh, Debbie Carew, a parent of an incoming ninth grader at Fullerton High School. Uh, Shannon Appenrod, uh, teacher at Sonora. Jessica Fernandez, teacher at Buena Park. Gina Jackson, a teacher and TOSA in our district. Myself and Dr. Minster were in, will be involved tonight. And I'd like to turn it over to Damaris for the student point of view. Good evening. I just have four quick points I want to share regarding student, student viewpoint on um, the distance learning. Um, my first positive feedback is that the weekly agendas that our committee recommended um, is a really good idea just to keep students' workload, expectations, um, Regular. Um, my next point is that a variety of learning platforms, which our committee also recommended, keeps um, students engaged and productive. And then I had two concerns that I wanted to share with the board tonight. Um, one is that my peers and students are concerned that distance learning is going to prevent peer interaction. At school, we have lunch and breaks to be able to talk to friends, but I just think it's, as a district, it'd be important to let our students know that just because we're on a computer doesn't mean that it won't be any group work and such like such as that. And then lastly, um, I'm personally concerned for students who have family responsibilities during distance learning. And I just think it's important to have grace for them during this time. Thank you. Um, I'm Debbie. And one of the things that I took back um, was that us as parents, uh, need to have a positive outlook, um, both in supporting our teachers and students, um, especially during the first part of the school year, because it will be a huge adjust adjustment. Uh, one of the concerns that we had um, 
and that's why I joined the committee, was the communication within the Google Classroom in Aries that we had struggles in uh, the spring. So we were hoping to get some of that ironed out. Also, um, the concerns of keeping the students focused and involved during the distant learning and Zoom meetings, and also the importance of being flexible because there will be interruptions, whether it's the Wi-Fi or younger siblings, um, responsibilities or just household learning at home. And I just appreciate the hard work that has gone into the summer from all the staff that I've worked with um, to try and make this school year successful. Thank you, Ms. Carew. Dr. Bailey, who is going to um, present this yeah. one? Next slide is uh, uh, Ms. Fernandez and uh, Ms. I'm Ms. sorry, Jackson. I forgot That's to okay. unmute. That's okay. That's all right. I apologize. Jessica Fernandez. Uh, the grading recommendations for the subcommittee are to revise the district syllabus template uh, to include categories uh, regarding attendance during this time, um, digital citizenship, academic dishonesty, uh, grading policies, potentially late work, and also student camera involvement uh, to give um, not only teachers, but to make sure that also parents are receiving uh, similar communication across the whole district. Um, also, uh, in a time of distance learning, to make sure that we have a platform accessible for collecting electronic signatures, uh, something like a DocuSign to deal with uh, getting class expectations back so that we have a documented record that uh, everybody's on board with the policies. Uh, this group also recommended uh, bringing back the original grading policy, reinstating the D and F uh, policy if possible, um, to bring back fair and equitable measures of accountability. Uh, this group also discussed parent communication uh, and the need to make sure that the parents are aware that uh, school, when it resumes here in the fall, will be uh, not similar to the spring and rather um, uh, getting back to a standard classroom and a higher expectation of student, um, teacher, and parent involvement. Uh, and then lastly, a uh, recommendation to uh, have district professional development regarding uh, different grading methods away from the uh, standard percentage grading, but looking at standards-based grading and rubric grading. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Hello, this is Gina Jackson. Um, good evening. So the subcommittee on assessments um, really looked at creating assessments around security, validity, providing equity, teacher training, focus, what are the logistics, and then the student workload. So our recommendations are um, that uh, teachers would be monitoring the students using GoGuardian and scenes on GoGuardian and using the cameras on the Chromebooks during Zoom meetings emphasizing the show your work and apply type of assessments to really get at the validity and make sure that our students are really learning. Working on creating assessments that are short and targeted that can be completed during one class period. And if it is a longer assignment like an essay or a project that students are given time in class to complete at least 50% of that um, project or essay. Posting grades in a timely manner so that students have um, enough time to remediate and be given uh, um, opportunities for remediation and also for the teacher to adjust their lessons to meet the needs of their students. And doing check-ins or conferences with students who are struggling and um, who might need some feedback. During hybrid, um, really important to minimize advantages for cohorts. So designing those um, assessments that wouldn't give one cohort more of an advantage than another. And then just creating a variety of types of assessments and using a variety of platforms. We would like for the August PD days to include time for designing these assessments to meet the security and validity 
um, requirements and also training on the tools needed to create the assessments. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Dr. Bailey, would you mind if we had questions now to ask them or would you rather wait till the end of the presentation? That's entirely up to you, Mr. Montoya. You can do whatever you'd like. Okay, I would like to, um, well, I would like to thank Ms. Oaks um, for her presentation. I have a question, Ms. Oaks. Um, can you go back to the first slide from Ms. Oaks? And thank you for, thank you to everybody participating in this um, task force. Um, I didn't understand the very, what is weekly agendas? What does that mean? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. One of the things that you'll read in our document that we wrote is um, that teachers district-wide post a weekly agenda on Google Classroom, mm -hmm. Google Docs, just that has the workload and the homework, if there is any, and assessments um, of what basically the students will be doing each day. Just because I know as a student going into Monday not knowing in the spring what we were going to be doing was stressful to a lot of my peers. So we talked about that in our committee and we realized that that would be something that teachers would be willing to do and would be really helpful for students as well as parents who could look at that. Thank you very much for that explanation. It explains a lot. Um, yeah. My fellow colleague board members, I can't see your faces um, because the screen has uh, less people on it. So if you have a question or something, you can just chime in, please. Andy, yes. I, I have a question for Ms. Fernandez. And it was relative to the grading. You had two points. One was that you hoped to go with the previous grading policy, not the one that we did in March. But then there was a second one regarding professional development, and you said something about a different grading method. So were those two statements in conflict with each other? No. Um, so for clarification purposes, even when you uh, review different grading methods, such as standards-based grading or rubric-based grading, they all still end up with A, B, Cs, Ds, or Fs. Uh, it was just a matter of um, uh, much of the professional development um, has been uh, the effort to get rid of the zero and the consequences that that has on a student's grade. And so if we can start to review different methods of uh, grading as far as the teacher side of grading uh, to come up with a, an equitable and fair and measure of accountability on that side. The grading policy bullet uh, is specifically related to um, the last spring's uh, policy where we um, D students moved up to a C and we did not give an F, we gave no credit instead. And there was uh, much discussion in the committee um, about the um, kind of lack of student effort that that created uh, and the need to recognize that in the spring we were in, a, in an emergency state of being and this is no longer an emergency state. This is kind of becoming the new normal uh, and that probably uh, the colleges will not continue to look past uh, students grades um, there could be potential backup with uh, kids needing summer school classes from all the no credits received and different things like that. Uh, as a um, that's why we had the desire as a committee to reinstate the grading policy A through F as it was originally. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a quick question? Um, I'm going to take Andy's silence as a yes because he's yes. on mute. So I'm just going to ask my question. Um, <laughs> Does some of the uh, feedback and comments that I received from teachers really talked about wanting to um, keep an eye on plagiarism and things like that during this time, especially. Um, does the district have any type of um, contract or use things like um, turnitin.com or anything like that? And is that something that could potentially be beneficial to help monitor plagiarism and things like that, especially, like I said, during this time. So there are uh, some schools using turnitin.com. Uh, I'm not sure if it's district wide, uh, but um, as far as uh, language that teachers might put in their class expectations, that's one of the reasons that we thought uh, it might be helpful to revise the district syllabus and include some of these items, especially during this distance learning time that uh, are causing teachers difficulty so that we can all use the same language in holding students accountable in regards to their, their camera time and their uh, academic honesty and things of that nature. 
Okay, thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Thank you, Ms. Glatzker. Um, anything else? If not, I'm gonna have Dr. Bailey move on his uh, presentation. All right, thank you. Next up is Dr. Minster. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, President Montoya. Uh, as we were looking at the various strategies that would be out there for all the kids and some of which have been alluded to already, um, a key part of that, of course, when we're dealing with at-risk students, or really all our students, is increased staff communication and outreach to students and parents that are not making connections, maybe the ones that aren't engaging, the ones that aren't showing up to class or some of their classes. Um, differentiated instruction, we talk about it a lot, but this is something right now, especially when we're in this, this, this distance uh, education mode or the hybrid, it's really something, it's going to be different for kids. Uh, we're going to have assignments for them, but we've got to be looking at um, what they're doing and how they're doing it. So differentiated instruction is going to be very important. And to that end, general education teachers and case carriers having contact and communication weekly, in some cases maybe daily, but they're going to be um, in close contact and this could be very important. Um, in terms of professional development, how to best support teachers, um, August is going to be a big deal. Um, we're going to give even more time at our sites uh, for training uh, with the technology uh, and with uh, various means of, of supporting the teachers and supporting our students and being able to have robust uh, learning at home. Um, the ongoing professional development on best practices for virtual classrooms, the new Logitech camera and microphone system, um, districts, district and site. Um, I hope you guys could hear me. I hope I wasn't muted the whole time. Um, district and site microphones and uh, professional development. And part of my screen is being obscured by uh, this little chart on it. So I can't see the rest of what I wrote there, but we're gonna have continuing district and site professional development on student engagement and um, continuing um, to um, support the teachers, so. Good evening. Um, our subcommittee, I'm Shannon Appenrod from Sonora High School, a teacher there. And our subcommittee really focused on student engagement and what that will look like in these new models. And we were very fortunate to have the student in our subcommittee. So it was great to hear, hear her feedback. So what some of the things we did recommend is we would like to see the district-wide weekly agendas, which we've already talked about, a variety of instructional modes as well, as a combination of combination of synchronous and asynchronous instruction and activities, virtual direct instruction in large and or small groups, and really to set online expectations and best practices. Some of the things that came up and specifically were profile names and pictures um, for the students establishing some guidelines. Um, during the spring, there tended to be problems with sometimes inappropriate names or pictures when they're joining Zooms like tonight. Attendance, once again, setting up attendance policies that are at least school-wide, if not district-wide. A lot of different teachers took attendance different ways, and our student did express that she was sometimes confused, you know, among different classes, what counted for attendance and didn't. Um, just talking about what participation looks like, Google Classroom becomes more important than ever, so making sure our students can navigate this easily. Um, and we talked a lot about teaching them to manage their classroom and their email, so they're not inundated with emails from Google Classroom where they just check out and stop checking their email at all. Um, and then just as Will mentioned previously, improving communication in every way. Um, another, well, when we were talking about hybrid model, we did talk about teacher choice for Wednesdays, what those would look like. We thought that would be really valuable, especially if some teachers wanted to focus more on cohort C that day and, and whatnot. And then our last suggestion would be researching alternative schedules for distance learning. And, and what that would look like. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Eppenrod. Thank you, Dr. Minster. Uh, again, uh, many of our uh, committee recommendations can be utilized in a hybrid learning model and distance learning format. So that was one of the things that our committee members really remarked on uh, over and again. These are just excellent strategies uh, across the board. And with that, we thank the board and cabinet for your time and attention, and we'd be happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Any of my colleagues have any questions? Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. Um, there was a slide about the communication um, with kids who may not be logging in or, or checking in with teachers. And I'm just curious because it's 
easy for somebody to fall through the cracks with six teachers because everybody thinks someone else has made contact with the kid. So I'm curious when um, we are developing these lists of kids who need this contact, will they be divvied up among the teachers who have them? Is it expected that that family or that child is being contacted by all six of their teachers? How will that be monitored? to make sure that nobody is falling through the cracks and that that student is actually being reached out to? Yeah, Ms. Klotzker, that's a great question. And we handle that as a complete site um, in conjunction with the classroom teachers. Um, sometimes it's not the student missing all six classes, but you know, one or two when they mi mi miss all six, uh, that certainly is an issue. But uh, our site administration along with our classroom teacher uh, we make connections, phone calls. There is a list that's developed. We monitor that list daily. We talk about it with our classroom teachers. Um, even our, uh, our police departments have been great resources in helping us for really extreme cases to get out into the community and make home visits. So it's a true team effort and lists are kept, documentation in ARIES and on spreadsheets so that we talk about that on a daily basis. Thank you. I have a question kind of connected to what Mrs. Klatsker asked. Uh, will the students be asked to check in period by period? Yes. They will. Yes, I mean, that is, that is the part of the mandate of the AB 77 and Senate Bill 98 is that we take attendance every day uh, for every student in every period. Okay. I have another question, Mrs. Applerod. Um, in the synchronous and asynchronous, you mentioned something about large group. If we are, I, I, get, I think what I'd like to ask a teacher is, um, what will a day look like? You know, I mean, what will your day look like and what will student A's day look like? But when, how do you transition from your classroom? And I'm assuming, well, I don't know if, how, I'm really not sure whether I can assume this or not. I know we've been working on the ABC cohorts. I guess the first question might be, are we going to start school in those ABC cohorts? Are we going to start school like we normally do? That would, but, um, but if you're in a classroom with say 15, 16 kids, and then how do you go to a large group? from the small group. I guess that would require some cooperation among the teachers. Right. Uh, I've asked about five questions there. <laughs> Who wants to sort that out? <laughs> no, no problem. Um, as to your first question, and I believe when we're going back, it won't be A, B, or C. We'll just be going back, correct? Is that correct? Well, right? We'll just be all going back. So the A, B, and C, that really comes into play when we're doing the hybrid learning. Um, and most of our meetings actually were focusing on the hybrid, but in the back of our minds, we all knew it might come to distance learning. And so we were trying to, you know, address the, you know, some of those issues. So what small learning, you know, large and small groups would look like. So if, for example, now let's say distance learning, because that's what we're going to, if we're doing a Zoom like this, one of the things that we can do as teachers is we can set up beforehand groups for the kids, and then we can do breakout rooms where, they, and we, we, they join the breakout rooms and then we can jump around from breakout room to breakout room. One of the things that our student did share with us is that she really missed and a lot of students missed working together, working collaboratively. And that skill, as we all know, is so important. And so we really wanna make sure we foster that with giving them activities that they can work on together. We were trying to figure out how that would work with A, B and C, but now that that's, you know, right now we're all going back so we can, you know, put them all together. And that's where the synchronous and asynchronous was really important. Sometimes the instruction will look like this. I'm speaking at you through a camera, you're sitting there and you're listening. But sometimes it might be pre-recorded, screencastifies, which our student also shared she really enjoyed because if she couldn't remember how to do something, she could go back and look at it, especially in math. You know, oh, that's how you do that again. And sometimes it's going to be me talking for 15 minutes and then I'm going to your breakout rooms or you're, you know, working on your assessment or your homework. So we really wanted to, you know, use different platforms and, you know, we're all learning as it goes. But that's our goal is not to just have, you know, the kids sitting in a chair six hours a day, the same six hours. We want to be creative. 
And it is fortunate Zoom has so much flexibility for breakouts and all kinds of things. So I, I think it, it sounds like a lot of work for all of you, but it sounds exciting too, to be doing something different a little bit. Yeah, it's exciting to learn to use this technology we have. Um, I think we all would rather be in the classroom with our students. And one of the things that I felt like in the spring, at least I had going for me, was I had such a strong connection already with my students. And so if someone was falling through the cracks, I could, you know, get a hold of them very quickly. I'm a little bit apprehensive about starting online just because we haven't built those connections. But that's where I think if we do a really good job at the beginning, we talked about this a lot in our group, building the rapport, building those bonds. So when they start dropping off, we can reach them more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. President Montoya? Yes. Uh, first of all, I would very much like to thank this committee. This is amazing work. I'm not surprised at the excellent work. Nonetheless, I want to acknowledge that it's excellent, excellent work. There are a couple things that I really liked that I wanted to highlight and ask a little bit about. One is there seemed to be a good emphasis on student workload. The weekly agendas help students see what their workload is going to be for the week. The idea of making assignments manageable enough, whether it's a quick turnaround, whether it's reteaching needed or simply grading feedback. And then also the acknowledgement that something that's going to take a little longer to allow some in-class time to do that. And I know that one of the challenges with distance learning is that it's just not possible to teach the class in exactly the same way as if you were sitting there live. So I really wanted to thank you on that. And then related to that is the question for professional development, much of it is how to use the tech, which is very important. Will some of it also be on how to adjust the expectations of a classroom where the rigor is still there, the expectations are still there, yet perhaps scaled a little bit differently. So that's, uh, that's a question. And then second, the other question is related to PD is teacher's anxiety always builds the closer we get to opening day. And no, this year more than any other year. So how soon will teachers know what professional development is gonna be offered those first two days so that they can begin thinking about either questions they want to submit ahead of time, or are there certain trainings they can sign up for, or what is that going to look like? I realize there'll be some variance site by site, but in general, what that's going to look like. So fundamentally, my question is a little bit more uh, information about the professional development. And thanks again for this excellent work. Can I speak on that for a quick minute? Um, this is uh, Gina. So as far as um, math is concerned, we've, our math teachers have been working um, this summer. We've had lots of professional development th this summer and um, taking our scope and sequence and looking at what are the key essential standards and topics that we wanna cover this next school year, knowing that we will not be able to cover everything. And then also they've had time to create materials and really have those conversations about how they're going to um, assess their students and what the workload might look like. Um, and so I think that time has been really valuable. But I know that other groups um, have also done some of that. And I know in the spring that was a huge, um, a huge concern for teachers. How much do I give? How much work should I give the students? And I think that a lot of us were asking our students doing surveys with them and asking them about the workload and getting that feedback from our student students was extremely helpful in knowing that, oh, okay, this is too much. Okay, so let me look at what I'm giving. How can I, how can I still make sure they're learning and showing me they've learned, but I'm not overloading them. So I, that's one of the things we talked about in our committee was that ongoing communication between the teachers and the students to um, ask them on a regular basis about the workload and about the platforms that we're using and what have they found to be the best, most helpful to them and that two-way communication um, being extremely important. Thank you. Any other questions? 
President Montoya and, and Ms. Foley. Um, on this note too, the answer to another part of your question in terms of the professional development, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Knowles, who's part of the uh, technology committee. The, the tech part is a huge piece of what's gonna happen when we come back on those days, in part because the new camera and the new microphone system is, is so important and so capable. But the other part that's uh, very, very important also was alluded to by Gina, is we have to look at what our curriculum is. We have to recognize that at some point we are gonna come back five days a week. At some point we're gonna be hybrid. But at the same time, what do our students need to know to progress successfully to the next course? As well as what do they need to know, presuming that we're gonna have AP exams this year again, we're gonna have probably IB exams again this year. So where do we need to fit with that? And that's gonna be a lot of our teacher groups having the time with the course alikes and with their programs, be talking about these things, along with what the expectations we receive from College Board or from IB or you know from Cambridge, let's be honest. So these are the things that we have to look at as well. Some of that's just, we're just gonna start with that PD when we return and it's gonna be ongoing as we go through the year. Thank you, and the sooner teachers know what that PD is gonna look like, uh, the sooner their anxiety level will drop at least a little. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question. Yes, Ms. Bush. In, uh, in your committees, were, were there any discussions about, we, there was a segment on at-risk students, and in some ways, there could be at-risk in different ways, I guess. Um, but not, you know, there will be some families where there are multiple children doing their work online. There will be some families where the parents are working remotely at home. You know, it, it's really an uneven playing field when you look at it that way. And I don't know whether you had any discussions in your committees about that or whether there's any ways to mitigate at all that, that issue. Well, we do have the ability as a district to provide hotspots uh, for families that need them and have uh, internet access issues. All of our students are one-to-one. -one. You're right, when you have uh, numerous people in a household uh, and not very much space, sometimes having a place to do your work can be difficult and, and a quiet space can be difficult. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, as much as we can try to mitigate that we can, I think some of what Ms. Jackson talked about in terms of workload and, and what we're asking the students to do and, and how we're um, gauging uh, their um, work and what they know, what we're grading for um, in terms of mastery, uh, all those things come to play. Um, and again, the hope is we're distance learning right now. We're, we're gonna do the absolute best. I think everybody has acknowledged from the governor on down that distance learning is no replacement for uh, being in front of your teacher. And so as much as we can do that and ultimately get to that point and have our students be uh, as progressed as they can be by the time we get to hybrid, and then by the time we get back to fully uh, being here at school, uh, that's what we're trying to do. And again, looking and, and making sure they're ready for not only this year, but for the next course in sequence. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Montoya, if I can make one more comment. Um, that's, that's another thing uh, we talked about in our group, as much as, as teachers, we may want our students and want to require them to have their cameras on and their Chromebook. We as teachers also have to recognize that some of our students may feel uncomfortable with that because their living situations, maybe they don't have a quiet place and they're you know, embarrassed by what's going on in back of them. So it's important for our teachers to remember that as well. I wonder if there's a way to help them with that. You know, you can find a corner. In fact, I've been on a lot of Zooms where it looks like the person who's doing the presenting is in the corner of the room. You know, I wonder why, who put them there. But, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to have a virtual backdrop from Hawaii to, uh, you know, to be able to do the work. So I, I don't know, that might be something to discuss with the kids. You know, don't worry, don't worry about that. Nobody's judging you know, what's behind you, it's, it's what you do. I think Ms. Jackson brings up, Ms. Bushy bring up good points because those are little tiny things. They're not tiny things, they're little things that, you know, sometimes you don't think about. And 
uh, us te uh, the teachers need to be trained and those those issues need to be brought up. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you, Ms. Bushy. Any other um, board member comments? I would like to uh, tell um, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Mr. Minster, Dr. Minster and all the people that presented today, thank you. Uh, great report. It was nice to hear from all of you and uh, I think it was a really good committee to get this done. So we appreciate it. At this point, Dr. Bailey, do you need anything from us? Uh, no, Mr. Montoya, this is only being presented tonight uh, is in the presentation form. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any further comment? I'd like to move on to 2.2.2, um, presentation from District Mental Health Committee, the Vista La Sierra High School Principal and Chair of the District Mental Health Committee, Sandy Leana, will give the presentation. Okay. I think that we have Scott Huffman who's going to share his screen at this time. Perfect. All right, thank you, President Montoya, Dr. Scambre, members of the board. The Director of Student Support Services, Scott Huffman, and I will be presenting tonight on the progress the Mental Health and Social Emotional Learning Subcommittee has made over the course of our summer meetings held on July 1st, July 8th, and July 13th. Next slide. The subcommittee was made up of representatives from FSTO and CSEA, classified staff, administrators, district staff members, and certificated staff, including teachers, counselors, a school nurse, and a psychologist. We also had active participation from our student and parent members. I already mentioned counselors, but I think it's important to note because our counselors work is so intrinsically tied to mental health and social emotional learning that each campus had a counselor participating on our subcommittee. Next slide. The subcommittee spent time overviewing the mental health and social emotional learning supports that were in place last school year. Counselors in particular expressed appreciation for the increase in these services that has taken place over the last two years. Next, we reviewed the additional supports that will be available in the 2020-2021 school year and how staff can access that support for their students and for themselves. In addition, at every meeting, we elicited feedback from all the stakeholders participating in the subcommittee. And finally, it is our objective to provide a clear articulation of services and supports to all students, parents, and staff. Okay, I'll hand this over now to Director Scott Huffman to continue the presentation. Thank you, Sandy, I appreciate it. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and to share this information with you guys. Um, the Next slide deals with kind of our vision as a district, what we've done to move forward in the initiative of social, emotional, and mental health. We've kind of taken a three-prong approach and focused on professional development and education to students, parents, and staff prevention, uh, services to students directly, which is intervention, which is critically important, and then agency linkage and partnership, something that we've begun to develop over the last few years that really helps us with post pension and, and follow-up. I'd like to be able to give you uh, just a little snippet of the work that's being done that was um, a big undertaking. We were able to uh, bring on board a mental health coordinator this last year, Carlos Alcantara, who has helped tremendously in implementation of the work that we've been doing. Uh, this is an example of what we're referring to as our implementation of our district mental health matrix. Now the matrix itself is an internal document uh, that we use for referrals to our agencies and the document is referral based, based on needs of students that have this area of support that's required. Uh, what we've done is we've developed the document to be able to be utilized by our staff, um, counselors, psychologists, assistant principals. We're not expecting teachers to be able to be in that space where they're making those recommendations. But what we are hoping is that our teachers are able to then talk to their staff members and make sure uh, that they're able to see what the needs are um, based on a tiered support system. Uh, starting with kind of tier one, uh, going into tier two, and then looking at tier three levels of supports for our students across the district. Um, underneath each of these are what you refer to as hyperlinks for the agencies that we brought on board um, as a part of our linkage. And for example, if you click on any one of these particular documents, uh, you would find a resource uh, regarding some of the information with some of those resources that we've been doing. 
Um, and then the process that we go through, like for example, Phoenix House is a new school-based student support program that we're offering. Um, and that's on the form itself. We've tried to create an easy way for our staff to be able to have access to this as they look at linking those referral systems. We found that to be very efficient for them to use. So that's just to give you a little glimpse of the particular uh, matrix that's in place. That will continue into the coming year. Um, we're not completed with it. We're always building and developing and working on that. Uh, the next thing I'd like to share with you that took place was an overview of services and supports for the 1920 for students, parents, and staff. We served over 600 student referrals to agency partnerships for counseling. This was a big number of kids that we were able to support this last year, and we look forward to continuing to do that this year with our new agency partnerships. We did information was provided during SIT, uh, intervention team meetings, IEP meetings, and staff meetings. We did mental health presentations at parent council meetings, uh, the development of the district-wide mental health work group, as well as developing articulation meetings with all of our feeder middle schools to help incoming freshmen link to appropriate mental health services. Uh, we're still doing that right now. Um, and then mental health presentations at DLAC, as well as bi-monthly meetings with Fullerton Collaborative, uh, the Health and Wellness Committee. I just attended that yesterday, as a matter of fact. A number of members are a part of this committee, including CHOC, and um, St. Jude and some other members within the community help partner with us. More specifically, some of the site trainings that were done are the um, mental health trainings that were done where mental health trainings presented to our AVID teachers, our people services administrators, school psychologists and nurses, uh, community liaisons and all school counselors. We did trauma informed school presentations to administration and school sites in Buena Park and Sonora social emotional learning techniques to be used in the classroom. We did that to site staff. And then we also conducted a uh, suicide risk assessment protocol and procedures, how to, how to under, understand that and approach those topics when they come up. School counselors were provided with additional resources and surveys for social emotional sessions. We focused on links to community resources. Um, OCDE is working in conjunction with hatching results to uh, help us enhance and develop our social emotional learning curriculum here in the district. Uh, Tilly's Life Center was one of our uh, onboarding agencies right now that we've been working with, specifically focused on secondary social emotional learning and curriculum, all tied to the CASEL uh, model. Um, and CASEL really has a lot of component parts that we want to look at at developing uh, skill sets and strategies for students. And then looking at strength based assessments of students and developing coping strategies, as well as our staff self care sessions that were conducted. We were calling them educator wellness. These were weekly sessions when school was closed that focused on developing techniques to be used uh, personally and professionally. It was a support that we provided uh, when uh, COVID closure occurred. Uh, newer things going into 2020, we're excited to say, as many of you know, we uh, recently sent out the informational email regarding Care Solace. Uh, Care Solace is a tier one support available to all parents and families and their students, as well as staff, if they need to link into this entirely anonymous and they allow families to get linked to agencies within the community uh, based on their background relative to their health insurance or if they don't have any, if they're Medica eligible, you simply ask a series of questions and it's available 24 seven with concierge service to help them link to the agencies. We look at moving forward to our district website and site specific looking at each school site with links to mental health resources that we'll be developing. This was a conversation that we talked about through the subcommittee. Also looking at an FAQ uh, that will provide parents with some insights on school-based mental health and services within the community. We also would like to provide parent education and training. We're working with a number of our agencies to put together webinars for our parents to be able to be equipped with and understand how to manage in times like this, as well as any other time that there might be stresses or strains within the family dynamic uh, due to a variety of different factors. Um, you know, Fullerton has taken an approach to consider looking at mental health as that we know we're a school-based system, we're a school-based model, but we know that we have mental health partners that specialize in this area. We are not a mental health facility, we are an educational facility, but we do want to link families to those, those places and spaces. We want to stabilize students. I, I like in the example of that we're the ambulance that gets them to the hospital. We try to get them stable and get them in a good space to be able to get those long-term supports uh, if they need so. This, so this was one of the things looking forward. Um, another sort of infographic that will be more widely shared is what we're considering our mental health services. We wanna educate in this arena. Each one of these are uh, blue links or, or live links. We have a mental health consent form for parents that's already in English, Spanish, and Korean. 
as we share services with families based on what they need, we wanna really get out and educate our families, teams, and staff on what resources are available uh, to students who are in crisis and who are struggling, as well as any supports that we can provide to staff. Uh, some of the things that came out of the committee was uh, making sure that we were providing our staff enough of those professional development ideas and areas to support them and their wellness. As you know, a survey went out on Monday of this week. Uh, we'll be finalizing and closing that out. Thus far, I've received over 450 responses from our staff as of Monday about how we could better uh, support their social and emotional well-being and what types of things that we could do. We gave them a drop down of other uh, as well as specific areas of types of trainings that we could conduct. But we see that fitting into the broader system of developing social emotional learning competencies for all involved, parents, staff, and students alike. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Sandy to close out. Okay, thank you, Scott. In conclusion, the Mental Health and Social Emotional Learning Subcommittee plans to meet one more time before school starts to review the results of the mental health survey that are in by that time. After that, it's our desire to continue meeting throughout the school year to review our progress and procedures and to continue calibrating our response to mental health and social emotional learning. And I'd like to add that it has been an honor to facilitate this subcommittee. Thank you, and that concludes our report. Thank you, thank you very much. Great report, thank you uh, for all the information. I had a couple comments, um, the first being that uh, you know, Dr. Scamry, when they send out the, um, the FAQs, um, they're going to be in Spanish, English, Spanish, and Korean. But can we get, a, the, as a board, can we get a copy of the, the FAQs? Because I think it's so important, uh, the mental health part. And we want to stay on top of this, especially during this time. No problem, Mr. Yes. Montoya. OK, thank you, Dr. Mr. Halpin. OK, board colleagues, do you have any questions? I have a couple questions. Ms. Katzker? Um, okay, so um, while we're talking about translating things, I noticed that at the bottom of the infographic, the consent forms were link hyperlinked in English, Spanish, and Korean. Will the infographic ex itself be translated into all three languages so that parents are able to, to read it in their native language? Yes. That was, okay, perfect. That was, you're nodding. I was about to jump into my second question. Um, I'm wondering if the committee um, talked about any type of regular check-in um, with students to help flag kids who may um, be at risk or experiencing depression or um, anxiety or whatever is going on with them. Um, some type of just universal, quick, super fast, like I know some districts are utilizing Google Forms once a week with kids, things like that. Was there any talk about that in the subcommittee? Yeah, we're gonna be sending out a, a survey link at the beginning, within the next week we're gonna be sending out, we did the one to staff, we're gonna be sending one out to students, but we're also gonna be sending out what we're referring to as a wellness screener. Um, it's gonna be going out at a more frequent rate for us to get baseline for our students across the district but it'll be something that we can send out for those students who we think we're not able to make that connection with or contact with. We're trying to get that information from students so that we can get feedback on how they need us to help them and support them. So we plan on doing something that to, like that to do progress monitoring. Thank you. And just in case you're listening to the, the board meeting and not seeing it, Dr. Or Mr. Huffman answered Ms. Klatsker, yes, that it is gonna be translated into their language. Andy, I have a couple questions. Um, Mr. Huffman, I probably know the answer to this based upon 400 inquiries from the staff, but do you anticipate there will be a, a larger influx of individuals with needs than we have seen in the past? Yes, in fact, I spoke with uh, VCC Gary, Gary Center, which is a partner of ours this year and last year, and uh, I just talked with them about the work that they've been doing with us and looking at onboarding social workers. As a matter of fact, one of the conversations came today about onboarding them and um, there was a new person they were talking about hiring. Uh, the conversation that I had with her, um, Courtney, was simply that we likely would see an increase based on the information being shared that we would see families accessing this resource more and that we would advise that that would be something that we could scaffold it and scaled up so that we can provide the supports as needed for parents and families. Thank you. I have one other question, and I maybe missed this in your presentation, but you 
reference something called the castle model. I'm not sure that I know what that is. Castle are the areas, the castle kind of put together a lot of the guess, the competency, five competency oh, areas that deal with social emotional learning. Those are the best practices that cover about building healthy relationships, uh, being able to uh, use and communicate in effective ways. And it has a five areas of competency that we use as part of our model for social emotional learning. It is the best practice out there right now. Thank you. Ms. Foley? Thank you. Uh, often as a teacher, you get tons of good information such as what's been included here. Maybe it's in an email, maybe it's staff development. And then you move into instruction kind of forget it, where it is, where it got buried in email, whatever. And then a student comes in crisis, whether it's grief or relational or something going on in their family. And often you're like, oh no, where do I go? So first of all, I wondered if there might already exist a flow chart, not that teachers would be directly referring to agencies, but who do they contact? Is it the community liaison? Is it the counselor? Is it an assistant principal? Depending on the situation. And then related to that, Given that we all we're not on campus and we can't just go seek out someone and have a quick conversation, maybe that information gets pushed out on a regular basis uh, and is easily accessible in a shared drive or something to that effect. And so maybe you could address like how teachers will be able to utilize this smoothly when we're not all together, when, you know, everybody's not all together on the same campus. Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things that we envisioned doing was um, creating, again, sort of that infographic type thing that you saw regarding the tiers of support, um, creating an opportunity for um, staff to have access to that at each school site. Uh, fortunately, in this arena, I can tell you we've had much success in the past with understanding the relationship when you can walk down the hall and talk to somebody. Um, this is a much different scenario with the distance learning that we've had to deal with in the virtual setting. So what we'd anticipate is uh, we've developed a Google site. Um, student services have developed a Google site a couple of years ago. And what we've been doing is building the site very carefully for, it's an internal site. Uh, you have to have a district um, email access, but under those um, links, are uh, those resource areas where our staff can go. What I would envision us doing is creating, like you said, kind of a flow of, hey, if I click on this, I know I can go to the student services website for our staff to have access to those resources. They're already there and they're available for our counseling staff, school psychologists, assistant principals. Many, the referral process that I shared with you that we use on the matrix is already going through the student services website. Um, a Google site, I should say. So we would envision the same type of thing being made available for general staff, uh, staff-wide. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. Okay, any other questions? Okay, at this point, um, we don't need to, we just had it for informational purposes only. And so um, thank you very much for that presentation. It's, it's, like I said, it's in the forefront of our minds, uh, the mental health of our students and staff. And, and so forth. So at this point, I'd like to. I want to, sorry, yeah. I want to add one thing, uh, yes. President Montoya. We do plan on sharing the results of the surveys uh, with you all, all right. as well. So once we get the surveys from the staff back, by the way, they are anonymous, done through SurveyMonkey. So we do not have the names of the individuals. We do have site and location. We plan on doing a similar type of thing for you all regarding the students as well. We feel that's very important information for you all to have to look at and understand the dynamics that we're working for and towards. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Mr. Thank you. Montoya? Yes. Uh, Mr. Huffman's uh, information right there is kind of a prelude to what I was going to ask, but I'm interested in the next steps in terms of board information and committee work and so forth as we move forward. Do we have that information? So next steps. I believe Mr. Huffman and Ms. Leona said that um, they're gonna meet again. Yes, we plan to meet one time before um, school starts to specifically go over the results of the survey that we have sent out. Um, and then to continue, it's our desire to continue to meet as the school year progresses, just to continue to calibrate and look at our procedures and, and what the needs are. Thank you. And I was looking even beyond that next steps in a more general sense, maybe the superintendent would be able to reply to that. Um, 
Can you be a little more specific, Marilyn? No. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it looks like there's still, the committees are still meeting. We know we're going to get the safety committee report. Um, we also um, were working on the, uh, the cohorts for the hybrid, should we move into that. Um, there's a lot of things that are in process that I thought the board would be interested in knowing as we move forward. And you probably know more what's in process than what we do. Yeah, if you could have a specific list. The, the cohort itself, it's just building the master schedule like we always do. The cohorts are built, uh, the same cohorts that we build, the classes we build for the distance learning will transition right into our hybrid model. That was the whole basic design behind, behind that. I think was with regards to the mental health, they've done a wonderful job. I want to thank everybody from the committees for putting all of that work in, uh, in this crazy landscape and dealing with the, the weekly and almost daily changes that we have and, uh, and, and the great recommendations that you've put in. I think uh, it's great that mental health, they've put a lot of work in, they've put a lot of things in place. Uh, I'm glad they're meeting again. Uh, we can give certainly give you updates, uh, but if you have a if you have a list, I'm I'm talking, speaking with the whole board. If you have a list of questions, as usual, please let me know. Uh, let us know, and we will answer those for you. Because this is such an issue, and we need to have tools for um, teachers and for um, and for students and parents and families. Could we put a tab on our our website? that has to deal with mental health and um, that we can uh, provide the, the directions or the flow charts um, on our website so that it's easily accessible and easily shared? Yes, that is the plan, absolutely, on the district website as well as each individual, individual site. Thank you. Are we expecting, and maybe this is to Marilyn's question, a follow-up, maybe a briefer report from the subcommittees as well as the presentation from the safety committee. And I recognize why the safety committee needed to wait a little longer because the landscape is shifting so quickly. And I, I have no doubt they've done the same excellent work, uh, just that the variables keep changing. So I don't know if that you want to if that is to be pushed out into our weekly updates or whether at the August 4th, if there's anything that a subcommittee feels has risen to a level of um, urgency or significance might be the better word to share with everyone in a more public venue. Because uh, I really appreciate everybody's time even being on this Zoom call. I know it's exhausting to sit on Zoom call after Zoom call, so thank you. Uh, so I don't know, Marilyn, is that what you meant? Like additional reports from the subcommittees? Yes, yes, partly. I, I just, again, as you said, there's there are a lot of people that is this is affecting all, all of our students, their families, our teachers, classified employees. I mean, this is this all, this affects everybody that you know, all of our constituents, as, as they say. So, you know, we get questions all the time. Uh, I like to have information when people ask me questions. It, I can always say I can get that information, but it's nice if I have it at hand. So I guess no surprises is what I'm looking for. Uh, I, I agree with you. We don't like surprises. No one likes and will we get copies of these presentations? Sure, we can do that. I think with regards to the uh, to the two committees that reported tonight, if there's anything that changes, significant changes, we can certainly report that out. Well, I thought they did extremely well, as everyone has said. So, and they answered questions that we had. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Jang, you good? Okay. At this point, I'd like to turn it to board members and superintendent comments. Uh, we'll start with our board members. Does anybody have any to uh, ending uh, comments? Dr. Zhang? Uh, I want to thank the committee members for all the work they did. It's, it shows that they put in a lot of time 
And it's a, you know, for all those people that publicly say that teachers don't do anything uh, during summer, it's completely wrong. They should be sitting here looking at what has the committee and all the teachers been doing. It's, it's a lot of work. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Dr. Jang. Uh, any other ones? Any other board members? Okay, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Scambray, do you have any comments? Nope, just great work uh, from committee members. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, with that being said, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for everybody for coming and, and have a safe uh, week until we see you uh, on August 4th. Thank, thank you. you.